All right, well, night one is done. Did y'all have a good night in your host homes? Yeah. All right, so tell me something fun that happened in your host homes last night. What's something fun that happened, Jordan? You learned how to knit. All right, I have never heard something as exciting as I learned how to knit. <laughs> All right. Oh, shot each other with Nerf guns. All right, man, that could have gone a really bad direction if you hadn't followed that up with Nerf guns. Oh, nice. <laughs> we shot each other and we all died. Oh, wait, it was Nerf guns. All right. All right. Anybody else? Something fun that happened. I, I challenged Blake to paper. paper football. And did you win? All right. <laughs> You slept, yeah. I slept too. That happened in my hotel room as well, and it was a lot of fun. And I slept later than I normally do. So that was awesome. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I wake up most days to a dog sniffing my face. So that happens almost every morning in my house. All right, now tell me something that you learned last night in your host homes. What's something that you walked away with from your uh, small group lessons or, or even this morning because you had another session this morning as well? Okay, good. All right, good deal. Anybody else? Something you learned, you walked away with either last night or this morning? Yeah, because we're ashamed. Is that what you said? Yep, yep. You'll hear some more of that word ashamed in our message this, this afternoon. It is afternoon, all right? Anybody else? <laughs> all right. All right, well, let me ask you one more question as we move into the message. What is something that scares you? All right, doesn't, uh, not necessarily... It related to, to Christianity, although it can be, but what's something in general, is there a fear that you have? What's something that scares you? Spiders, all right. How terrified of, of spiders are you? All right, all right. Tornadoes, all right. My daughter, she used to call them tomatoes. When she, she would tell me she'd come home from school, she'd be like, we had a tomato drill at school. And I was like, what is that? Adulthood. You should be afraid of adulthood. Very afraid of adulthood, yes. <laughs> All right. Any other fears? Something you're afraid of? The IRS. <laughs> Just you wait. <laughs> Wasp. Okay. Yeah. Nathan and I, we used to go around here with a wasp spray and, and have to tackle all the nests. Do you do that by yourself now, Nathan? Yep. <laughs> Dogs. Okay. Did you have a bad experience with the dog at some point in time? Yeah. Yep. All right. That'll do it to you. That'll do it to you. So, oh, you got one? Butterflies. That is like the least scary thing. <laughs> huh? <laughs> you were there and I will kill you now. <laughs> Attack of the killer butterflies. <laughs> All right, well, I guess we'll let that one slide then. <laughs> so I personally am afraid of snakes. Anybody else afraid of snakes? Nobody said that. I hate snakes. I don't want to look at snakes. Yeah, Indiana Jones. I don't want to look at snakes. I definitely don't want to hold a snake. So in our uh, in Stockdale, where I live, uh. The Church of Christ every year leading up to Halloween, they have a big fall carnival with lots of bounce houses, games, prizes, all of that. But the pastor of the Church of Christ, 
he is super into wildlife. In fact, he has owned a kangaroo at one point in time. So he's super into wildlife. And uh, and so they have there the, this little house outside of their house uh, that's filled with snakes in cages, but it, it's filled with uh, filled with snakes. And so at the fall carnival, you can stand in line and uh, you can go and hold one of the, the snakes, non-venomous, but you can hold one of the snakes. And so uh, a couple of years ago, we went to the fall carnival. His name is Jeremy. And so uh, my wife said, you should go say hi to Jeremy. Well, he was over running the snake booth. And I said, absolutely not. And she said, why don't you want to go say to him that, uh, say hi to him? That's rude. And I said, because if I go say hi to him, I know that he's going to try and convince me to hold a snake. And I don't want to do that whatsoever. So, so I said, I, I'm not going to say hi. I don't care if it's rude. I'll say hi to him another time. Like, <laughs> that's just not going to happen. Uh, but I'll tell you another story. Uh, this one's a little more recent. Uh, in the fall of this year, we went over to a, a couple's house, a couple in our church. We went to go have dinner with them uh, and their family. And, and so we had had dinner. They grilled out. Uh, we had been in and outside. The doors had opened and closed a couple of times. And so after we ate, we were just hanging out in their living room watching TV. And as we're hanging out watching TV, I see on the floor a snake slithering towards the TV. And I jumped up on the couch like a little girl. And, and I said, snake. And uh, to really challenge my manhood even more, the wife of, of the, the family that we were with, she grabs a pillow and she goes and attacks the snake and, and holds it down till they can get it out. And I just stayed on the couch the whole time. I did nothing to help whatsoever. So I am afraid of snakes. I hate snakes. But this weekend, we're not talking about being afraid, this weekend we're talking about this word brave. So before you throw this definition back up there, don't throw it up. Who remembers the working definition that I gave you for the word brave last night? Anybody? Anybody remember? You can refer to your notes if you wrote it down. All right, this is a, a little challenge for you. John? All right. Okay. That was part of, that was being brave in your conversion. So yes, that, that is part of what I shared last night. All right, anybody else? I see notes, Jordan, no. All right. All right, there you go. I like it. There you go. She gets 100 gold star for Jessica. All right, it pays to write stuff down. <laughs> All right, so yes, having the willingness and the readiness to walk in obedience to God regardless of cost or circumstance. And so while we may not have to go and handle a snake or we may not have to go and handle spiders or, or address some of these other fears, sometimes, right, there are things that God calls us to do that maybe it is a little bit scary to us. Maybe it is going to cost us something, or it is a tough circumstance, a scary circumstance that, that we enter into. But the reality is, is that God still calls us to walk in that anyways. We are to have the willingness and the readiness to walk in obedience to God, regardless of cost or circumstance. So you remember, we were talking about four different things this weekend, about being brave in four different things. Brave in our conversion, that's what we talked about last night. Brave in our confession, brave in our calling, and brave in our commission. And so this afternoon, we're talking about being brave in our confession. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to 2 Timothy this afternoon. 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, if you have to refer to the table of contents in your Bible, that's okay. That's what it's there for. 2 Timothy chapter 1, the big numbers are the chapters, the little numbers are the verses. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 12. Now, as we think about that word confession, right, in a general sense, to, to confess something really means to, to speak the truth about, about something. So like if you murdered someone, any murderers in here? 
Oh, no. <laughs> All right. Ian just confessed. <laughs> if you confess something, right? If you, if you murdered someone and you confess, right, you're saying the truth about what you did. Now, it, it, that's, that's the general sense of that word confession. As we think about the biblical sense about that word confession, we, when we talk about our confession as a believer, really, we're telling the truth about who Jesus is. Much like what we talked about last night with Peter saying the truth about Jesus, regardless of the crowds, regardless of what anyone else said, Peter said the truth about Jesus. He confessed Jesus as God's Messiah. He confessed Jesus as the Savior and as Lord. So as we're looking at this passage today, the book of 2 Timothy was written by the Apostle Paul, who was in prison for his faith. He was in prison for his confession Of Jesus, because Paul was bravely confessing Jesus. Well, why was Paul brave? I think this is an important question for for us to ask. Why was Paul brave? Because I think sometimes as we look at people in scripture, we think, well, sure, of course they were brave. Of course, Paul was brave. He was an apostle. Of, Of course, Paul was brave. He's written about in the Bible. I think sometimes we look at these people in scripture and we elevate them, we put them on these pedestals and we say, well, yeah, of course that's true about them. They're in the Bible. But the reality is, is that Paul and many of these others that we see in scripture, the reality is, is that they were also people. You know, I will often tell uh, our congregation at my church in Stockton, I'll say, you know, before I was a pastor, I was a person. And even after becoming a pastor, I'm still a person, right? And this is a good reminder for us as we think about people in Scripture as well. Before they were in Scripture, they were were people. Before Paul was written about in Scripture, he was a person. And even after being written about in Scripture, Paul was still a person. And so why was Paul brave? If Paul was a person just like you and me, why was Paul? Paul brave? Well, first he was brave because Paul had met Jesus. Paul was brave because he had met Jesus. Some of you, you may be familiar with the story of of Paul's conversion. When Paul gave his life to Christ, when Paul was saved by Jesus, Paul was walking on a road to Damascus. But prior to his journey on this road to Damascus, prior to Paul's conversion, when he met Jesus, Paul was a hater of Christians. Paul was a devout Jew. Paul knew the law. When it came to the law, Paul Paul could say, man, I am the best at the law. I know the law. I can keep the law. Paul was a Jew through and through. And because he was a Jew through and through, because Paul loved the law, he hated Christians. Because Christians, right, they weren't following Judaism. Christians were following Jesus. Christians were saying that that the Messiah, the one that, that had been talked about, the one that the Jews were waiting for, Christians were saying this Messiah had come and it was Jesus and he died and he rose again. Paul didn't like that. So Paul hated Christians and Paul participated in and he provoked the persecution, the suffering, and even the killings of Christians. Paul was not a good man. He may have followed the law, but but Paul was not a good man. Here's the reality too. Before we come to Christ, we are not good. Now, we may look at our lives and feel like we are good, but the reality is, like we talked about last night, we have all sinned. And because of our sin, bottom line, when it comes to how good God is and how perfect God is, when we look at the sin in our life, we are not good. Paul was not a good person. And so he's walking on the road to Damascus and he has an encounter with Jesus. Now, Jesus didn't appear to him in the flesh. Jesus appeared to him as a light, a blinding light. 
And Jesus said to Paul, Paul, why do you persecute me? Why are you persecuting me? Now that word persecution, it it means to mistreat. That's what Paul was doing to Christians. Paul was mistreating Christians. Here's the reality. When Christians are mistreated, scripture tells us it's not truly because the Christians are hated. It's really because Jesus is hated. The one that they were following is hated. So the reason why Paul hated Christians is really because Paul hated Jesus. And Jesus knew this. And so Jesus said to Paul, Paul, why do you persecute me? And in that moment, Paul knew Jesus was speaking to him. Paul knew that it was the Lord. And in that moment, Paul became saved. Paul became converted. On the road to Damascus, Paul became a new creation. He was changed by God as we think about what we talked about last night, being brave in our conversion, right? Paul was changed by God. So as we think about Paul being changed by God, as we think about Paul meeting Jesus, the question is, is have you met Jesus? Has there been a time in your life that you have encountered Jesus, whether it's at church, whether it was in reading God's word? Has there been a time that you have encountered Jesus and you have surrendered to the truth of who Jesus is, allowing him to be the Lord of your life, forgiving you, transforming you, changing you, converting you into a new creation? Have you met Jesus. I was five years old when I met Jesus. I had been attending church for my whole life. I know it was only five years, but I had been attending church my whole life. My dad was a pastor at that time. And so pretty much from birth, I was at church and I was at church for every single event. And we were taking the Lord's Supper at church one Sunday. And when the plate came to my family, my mom and my sister and I, my mom didn't let me participate in the Lord's Supper. I didn't understand why. I'm here just as much as you are. I participate in everything that you participate in. Why are you not letting me take the Lord's Supper right now? And so my mom explained to me, Not in that moment, but later on that afternoon after church, my mom explained to me the gospel, that I was a sinner, that Jesus died for my sins, that the juice represents his blood shed, that the the bread represents his body broken. And she told me that just because I go to church doesn't mean that I'm a Christian. You may need to hear that today, just because you go to church does not make you a Christian. It does not mean that your life has been changed. It does not mean that you have surrendered to Jesus. It means that you come to church and that's a good thing, but it does not mean that your life has been changed by God yet. And so my mom explained to me that that just because I went to church didn't make me a Christian. And I realized there was something that I was missing out on more than just the Lord's Supper. I was missing out on eternal life. And so in my bedroom, that Sunday evening, I met Jesus. And I got down on my knees next to my bed in the bedroom, actually the same house that I live in now. So in the bedroom that is now my son's bedroom, I got down on my knees and I prayed and I asked Jesus to forgive me of my sins and to become my Savior, and my Lord. So the question is, have you met Jesus? Not do you come to church. Have you met Jesus? Has Jesus saved you? Paul was brave because he had met Jesus. But Paul was also brave because of what we read in verse 7, just before our passage. In verse 7, we read, 
For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and sound judgment. Listen, if if you are a believer, if you have given your life to Christ, then you have a new spirit inside of you. No longer do you just have your own spirit inside of you. Now you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. It is a spirit that we receive, the spirit of God that we receive in our life when we become a Christian, when we are converted, when we are made into a new creation. And as we think about this new spirit that is inside of us, this Holy Spirit is inside of us, it is not a spirit that cowers when it comes to confessing Jesus, when it comes to our testimony of who Jesus is. The spirit that God has given us is not a spirit that cowers. It's not a spirit that that jumps up on the couch in fear and has someone else do the job for, for us. God has given us a spirit of power, of love, and of sound judgment. He's given us a spirit to be brave. And so even though we are not Paul, even though we are not written about in Scripture, if you have given your life to Christ, then you have a spirit inside of you that gives you the boldness and the bravery to stand firm in your confession, even when it might be scary, even when it might cost something, even when the circumstance is not great. We have a spirit that gives us bravery and boldness. But now let's see what our passage says about this call to be brave in our confession. So we're gonna pick up in verse eight and we're gonna read through verses, uh, verse 12. It says, so don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Instead, share in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God. He has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. This has now been made evident through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. For this gospel, I was appointed a herald, apostle, and teacher, and that, and that's why I suffer these things. But I'm not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to guard that, uh, to guard what has been entrusted to me until that day. So in verse eight, we see that word ashamed again. We saw that word last night, ashamed. And so once again, we have this reminder that we are not to be ashamed. Now, there are some things that we might do, there are some things that we should be ashamed of. We should be ashamed of mistreating our parents. If we mistreat our parents, we should be ashamed of that. I remember when I was in high school, I had a routine after school every day. I would come home, I'd turn the TV on, and I'd get on the couch, and I would take a a nap until it was dinner time, just having the TV play in the background. Anybody else fall asleep watching TV? I do that now. I turn on the office at night and I just fall asleep on the couch watching TV. All right, so I would do this. I'd come come home from school. I'd turn on the TV, set it on the couch, and I'd fall asleep. And so I had already, one particular day, I had already lied, uh, laid down on the couch, listening to the TV, dozing off, and my mom told me to come and do the dishes. We didn't have a dishwasher in our our house. Anybody not have a dishwasher at your house? Praise the Lord for that, right? Technology. We did not have a dishwasher in the house. I was the dishwasher in the house. And so my mom told me, get up and do the dishes, and I began to yell at my mom and 
tell her I was absolutely not going to do the dishes. I was going to stay on the couch, laying down, taking a nap, and I would do the dishes when I was good and ready. I know, right? Yeah, I do not recommend that. Yeah, and this is not the first time that I've shared this story with, with a group of people, but even as I share that story, man, as I think about that, I'm ashamed of that, especially now that I'm a parent and I have a teenage daughter of my own. I'm ashamed of myself. We should be ashamed if we mistreat our parents, if we mistreat other people. Ultimately, we should be ashamed of our sin. Because when we sin, not not only are we, we're, we're not only dis- disobeying our parents, we're disobeying someone far greater than our parents. When we sin, we are disobeying, we are walking in disobedience to the one true God. And if you're a believer, then you are walking in disobedience to the God who has saved you, to the God who has called you out of your sin, to the God who has made you into a new creation. And so we should be ashamed of our sin, but when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to our confession of Jesus, when it comes to saying the truth about Jesus, who he is, we should never be ashamed of the gospel. We should never be ashamed of our confession of the good news of Jesus Christ. I want you to know that. If you are a Christ follower, when it comes to the good news, you have nothing to be ashamed of. Now, the world may tell you at times that you should be ashamed of that. Your friends at school may tell you that you should be ashamed of that. Influencers on TikTok, Instagram, right? All of those things. They may tell you you should be ashamed of trusting in, believing, following, walking in obedience to Jesus. But the reality is, is that if you are a Christ follower, if you are obedient to God's word, you have nothing to be ashamed of. So there's a couple of truths that I want you to see in this passage about being brave in our confession. First, we can be, a, we can be brave in our confession even if we suffer. Let's look at what Paul said again. He said, instead, share in suffering for the gospel relying on the power of God, right? The truth is, is that we could suffer for the sake of the gospel. We could suffer for our confession of who Jesus is. Now, as we think about suffering, it could be scary because sometimes our mind goes to the worst case scenario. And for me, the worst case scenario is death. In my mind, worst case scenario, that is always gonna be death. So when I was young adult pastor here at First Baptist Watauga, I took the young adults out ice skating one one night. We had a young adult in our group that was actually really good at ice skating. He could do spins. He could do tricks on the ice. He was really good. And so he asked me, he said, do you want me to teach you how to, how to spin around? And I said, no. And he said, well, what's the worst that could happen? And I said, I could die. Right? If we're talking worst case scenario, that's the worst case scenario, right? I fall down. I hit my head on the ice. Boom, I'm dead forever. Right? That's the worst case scenario. Right, as we think about being afraid in our suffering, worst case scenario is that we could die. Now, truth be told, here in America, the chances of us being killed right now for our faith in Christ, very low. In other countries, it's a lot higher. Countries like China, Eastern countries, right, a lot higher over there. And people literally are dying for their faith in Christ, being beheaded for their faith in Christ in other countries. We're not experiencing that here. The worst that might happen to us is someone might tell us to shut up and go away, right? And that terrifies us. 
What if they don't like me? That terrifies us. And we have some in other countries losing their heads, literally, for their faith in Christ. Death is the worst case scenario, but here's the reality. Even if we die, we continue to live. Paul says it in this passage that Christ has abolished death and brought immortality to light. In other words, if you have given your life to Christ, if you have eternal life in Christ, you may die in this life. In fact, many of us will experience death in this life, even if someone doesn't kill us, right? Just because life comes to an end, right? Unless the Lord returns and takes us all home, then we're gonna experience death in this life. But if we are a believer, if we have given our life to Christ, then the reality is, is that death is not the end of the story for us. Life is. Because now we have eternal life in Christ. So Winston Churchill, he was the prime minister in England uh, back in the 1940s. He actually uh, led England to their victory in uh, World War II. So Winston Churchill, when he passed away, he had a graveside service. And at his graveside service, he requested that the song Taps be played. Taps is a song that's played at the end of the day. It's, it's the signal that the, uh, that the day has come to and then that the day is over because Winston Churchill knew that his life on this earth would have come to an end. He knew that his life on this earth would be over. But immediately following taps, he asked that the song Reveille be played because he knew, well, let Reveille, Reveille is the song that you play at the start of the day. It's a song that indicates that the day is not over, but that the day is just beginning and that it's time to get up. Winston Churchill knew that while his life on this earth would be over, while his life on this earth had come to an end, he knew that that was not the end of the story for him. He knew that he was gonna hear those words, it's time to get up that his spirit would continue living in the presence of God and that one day Jesus would return and even his body would be resurrected to be reunited with Jesus in the air. And so even if we die in this life, death is not the end of the story for us. Really, we just get a new address. We simply move into the presence of Jesus Christ. And so, When we suffer for our faith, even as our mind goes to that worst case scenario, I could die. Even if we experience death, we get to continue living. And so we can be brave in our confession, even if we suffer. Second, we can be brave in our confession because we know the one who is greater. Anybody ever met a famous person in here? Anybody? All right, who have you met? Okay, some Broadway actors and actresses, okay. Okay, cool. All right, anybody else? You met someone famous? John Cena, right? Who's that? Gospel Greg, the most famous person ever, all right? McDarnett, all right. (laughs) Anybody met Connor Torres? I hear he's... I hear he's famous. <laughs> uh, anybody heard of Carrie Job? I know Carrie Job. All right. For those of you who have not heard of Carrie Job, she is a Christian singer, song artist. Uh, Matthew, do you know any of her songs? What are some of the songs that they might? Revelation song. Yeah, forever. So there, there are quite a few popular songs. You, you'll hear Carrie Job on the radio. Uh, many churches sing her uh, worship songs. Uh, and, and so when I was in college, my freshman and sophomore year, I actually went to college with Carrie Job. So I knew Carrie Job before she was Carrie Job. Uh, and so 
Uh, I I was not friends with Carrie Job. I can't claim that, but I did go to the same school that she went to, and uh, so I was working in the library at our school my freshman year, uh, and she happened to be in the library checking out a book, and so she came to the counter and checked out a a book from me, and so I I talked to her a little bit. I may have tried to flirt with her some. Turns out I did a terrible job, uh, and so but that's okay. I'm you know. What's that? Yeah, and I, I definitely did not know how to, all right? But, you know, uh, just how it is. But I met Carrie Job when I was in college, all right? But here's the deal. No matter who you might have met, no matter how great that person might be, if you know Jesus, then you know someone who is greater. Listen, there's a lot of influence out there influencers out there on social media that we follow. And and many times we put a lot of stock into what they say, what they tell us. Sometimes, especially if it's Christian, sometimes they might be telling us some good things. But here's the deal. No matter how many followers that person has, if you know Jesus, you know someone who is greater. He is greater than anyone in this world, anyone who has power or fame, Jesus is the one that's greater, but he's also greater than our suffering. He's also greater than our struggles. So imagine with me that you're walking down a a dark alley and in this dark alley, someone jumps out from the shadows and they've got a weapon, a knife or a gun or something. That would be pretty terrifying, right? But now imagine that you're walking down this alley with someone that you know is greater than any person or weapon that that might jump out at you in this dark alley. Maybe it's a superhero, right? From Marvel or from DC, whichever side of the camp you're on, right? Maybe it's a superhero, but you're walking down this alley and you know you're with someone that is greater than whoever might jump out at you, right? It it, it takes the fear out of walking down that dark alley because you know, even if someone jumps out, it doesn't matter. You're with someone who's greater than them. Listen, if you know Jesus, if you are a believer, no matter what you face for your confession of Jesus Christ, whether it's suffering or whether it's even death, you know someone who is greater than that suffering. You know someone who is greater than that struggle. And so you can bravely walk into whatever it might be with confidence because you're with the one who is greater. And so as we think about being brave in our confession, we can be brave in our confession even if we suffer and we can be brave in our confession because we know the one who is greater. But the question remains for you guys this weekend, Do you know the one who is greater? Can you say that you are brave in the face of suffering, in the face of struggles, or even in the face of death for your confession of Jesus Christ because you know the one who is greater? Do you know the one who is greater? Do you know Jesus Christ? If you don't, then there's still time this weekend Grab one of your leaders today, whether you're at Whirly Ball, whether you're hanging out here at the church, whether it's another with uh, one of your small group times later on, grab a leader, talk with them. Tell them, today, I want to know Jesus as my Savior and my Lord. I want to know the one who is greater. Let me pray for us, and then I'm going to turn things back over to Nathan. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. I pray, Lord, that you would embolden us and empower us to bravely confess you, Lord, to bravely say the truth about who you are, no matter what we might face, whether it's suffering or whether it's death, God. May we boldly and bravely face that because we know the one who is greater, Lord, because you have given us a spirit of power, of love, and of sound judgment. Lord, would you empower us with your spirit once again, even today, God? If there's anyone here, Lord, that does not know you, I pray that this weekend, that today would be the day that they would give their life to you. 
It's in your name I pray. Amen.